From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he had to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and legal experts, and that he had to be killed and then raised on the third day. Then Peter took hold of Jesus and, scolding him, began to correct him. God forbid, Lord, this won't happen to you. But Jesus turned to Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stone that could make me stumble, for you are not thinking God's thoughts, but human thoughts. Then Jesus said to his disciples, All who want to come after me must say no to themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. All who want to save their lives will lose them, but all who lose their lives because of me will find them. Why would people gain the whole world but lose their lives? What will people give in exchange for their lives? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I have to admit that this series on mental health is quickly becoming one of my favorites, and I say that for very selfish reasons. Mental health is so out of my wheelhouse that it offers a whole new way of looking at scriptures, and it has fascinated me. It's like putting on sunglasses on a sunny day, and now that you're no longer squinting to try to keep the sun out or maybe using your hand to block just that one spot, you're able to see a little bit more clearly with those sunglasses on and able to see objects that you may not have otherwise seen. Now, this past Wednesday, the confirmation class put it another way. They talked about preaching being the art of pointing out the sparkle and pizzazz within the scriptures. And depending on what angle you are looking from, different elements of the story will sparkle and pizzazz. One of the things that we have been looking for in this series has been balance, which is actually a kind of a hard concept to promote. So often we want to jump right to the good and say, look how fantastic life can be if. But in this series, we're invited to acknowledge the challenges, so we can accept the celebrations. Balance doesn't mean focusing on one side or the other, no matter how good one side might be. And today is no different as we look at the topic of filtering out the positives. Now, this topic is actually a small subset of a larger field known as cognitive distortions. And yes, the first time I heard that term, I asked Emily if we were going to be handing out dictionaries alongside bulletins. And she said, don't worry, Pastor, it's not that hard to understand. She goes, break it, break it down. Cognitive means the way that we think. And distortion means an inaccurate impression. So in other words, cognitive distortions are tricks that our minds play on us that give us a false impression of the world around us. And an all-too-common trick we play on ourselves is to filter out the positive and convince ourselves that just everything bad is happening around us. Interestingly enough, I, I found out a, a, a fun fact, if you will. Maybe it's not so fun. I'm not sure. But did you know that our minds are hardwired to focus on fear and negativity? According to scholarship, our brains are designed to prioritize survival, part of the reason why we still exist as a human culture. Fear, though, is an important emotion, especially for our ancient ancestors, to avoid dangerous situations and continue living. When they knew that a bear was coming at them and they were not going to do well, they decided, let's get out of here. Fear, it was helpful, still can be helpful. But... Scholar Debbie Hampton suggests that this negativity bias is still active in our brains today and can get in the way of our happiness, it can up our stress and worry levels, and it can actually damage our brain and our health. In other words, we have become overly proficient at fixating on the negative. On this music ministry celebration Sunday, let me give you a real example from my musical past. I remember playing in the orchestra during my high school years, and the thing that I hated most was the chair tests. How many of you have ever done a chair test before? Yeah, a number of you. Now, chair tests were auditions. 
to see if you would be first chair, second chair, and third chair down the line, however many chairs there were in a section. And in high school, we did this every time before we had a concert. And we would practice up the music that we were given for that concert, and we'd go before our orchestra teacher, and we would play a solo audition, and then she would rank us based on how well we knew the music. And one particular time when I was given third or fourth chair, I remember being quite disappointed that I was not higher. Now, as I look back objectively, I clearly understand why I was not higher. <laughs> but I also remember my orchestra teacher's comments on my chair test. She told me that I did wonderful on this part, I did great on that part. She even told me that, you know, this one section, I hit those notes perfectly, and that has given other students some trouble. But one of the things that she would have liked to have seen was a little bit more polish when shifting my hand positions. So what did I do with that feedback? I went back and I drilled my hand positions over and over and over again. Now that's not a bad strategy if I wanted to improve on my instrument. But I have to say that internally, I did not feel good about that piece of music. Instead, I focused so much on the critique I got that I completely ignored all of the parts of the music that went well. In essence, I filtered out the positive remarks and focused on the negativity. Now, to a certain extent, we all do this. Remember, we are hardwired with a negativity bias. However, we see this in a very unique way in our scripture passage today. To set the stage, our passage comes just after Jesus asks the disciples, who do you say that I am? Which sounds like a trick question in and of itself. But Peter comes back with a really unique response, and Peter says, Jesus, you are the Christ. You're the one we've been waiting for. And Jesus responds, giving Peter high praise, and even tells Peter that he will be the rock on which the church is built upon. Then immediately after that passage, we hear Jesus continue teaching our scripture passage today. And he tells the disciples that he will suffer at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the legal experts. In fact, he will suffer to the point that they will kill him before he will rise again. And Peter jumps in almost before Jesus can finish. And in my mind's eye, I have Peter grabbing Jesus by the arms and shaking a little bit and, and telling, no, Jesus, we won't let this happen to you. We're even told in the scriptures that Peter scolds Jesus. That's a bold move. But what happens next has always confused me and irritated me, if I'm being honest. After Peter shows genuine concern for Jesus, Jesus yells at Peter and says, get behind me, Satan. I've always felt that was a bit extreme. I've wondered why Peter was being reprimanded for not wanting harm to befall his friend, his teacher, and his recently proclaimed Christ. And as I reread this passage this week with the lens of mental health, I realized something pretty important. Peter was filtering out the positive, as perhaps many of us were as we listened to the, the passage this morning. Yes, Jesus talks about his suffering and execution, but he also talks about his resurrection, even giving a calendar date. This is something Jesus rarely ever does and says, three days after I die, I will rise again. Now, this is clearly something that Peter and the other disciples filtered out as they focused on the bad news of Jesus' death. You see, if they paid attention at this point, and if they could hold that as part of, of what they were hearing, they would have been with the women at the tomb on that morning of the third day. But Peter filtered out the positive, and his brain only processed the part about suffering and death. It's no wonder Jesus yelled out, get behind me, Satan. Who else would want to silence the hope of resurrection? Who else would want to keep us fixated on the tomb rather than experiencing life in the garden? Who else would want to keep us in a place of fear rather than in a place of renewed life? It feels harsh, though, to suggest that Satan took over Peter's mind, but there may be another explanation. For instance, did you know that Satan is not actually a proper name. It's a title. 
kind of like Christ. Jesus' last name is not Christ, but it's a title meaning the anointed. So when we say Jesus is the Christ, we are saying Jesus is the anointed one. Satan is a title that means adversary or someone who stands in opposition. When Peter was so focused on protecting Jesus, he was standing in opposition to death. That is usually a good thing. But with no death, there's also no resurrection. And Jesus made sure to proclaim that part as well. As followers of Christ, our hope is built on the promise of resurrection, on the promise that life triumphs over death, that hope springs forth from the bleakest of circumstances, that life emerges from the chaos. Now note that Jesus does not tell Peter to get behind him. And Jesus does not even retract his statement that Peter will be the rock of the church. Instead, he looks at Peter and says, that kind of thinking is going to then be a stone that we're going to stumble upon. Don't filter out the positive of this. So instead, Jesus tells Satan, the adversary, the idea of opposition to get behind him. Jesus recognizes that there is bad news in his suffering and death, but if, it were so, if we are so focused on death, we have nothing left to look at for the life that follows. When we hold the negative and positive in balance, we start to see the full picture which is hope in the resurrection. The cognitive distortion we are talking about is filtering out the positive. Please hear, we are not suggesting to replace this with filtering out the negative. The series is about finding balance and holding the tension between positive and negative together. Scholar David Burns suggests it's about developing a balanced outlook by noticing both the positive and the negative. I can tell you that I would have never improved as a musician if I did not practice the spots that gave me trouble. But fixating on the one thing that needed work negated all the hard work that I already put into the piece. In fact, on occasion, I got so stuck on that one thing that needed work that, as I mentioned, I I ended up not liking the song at all just because I found one small section difficult to play. I was grateful for one of my music teachers in particular. I was grateful for all of my music teachers. Please hear that. But there was one in particular that was remarkably good at balancing the positive and negative. She would often get very nitpicky with me on certain parts of the song. And as we would go through these songs, she would remind me that when she got that nitpicky, it served as a reminder of how good the music was really truly coming along. She told me that we would not be able to focus on getting minor details right if there were major portions of the song that needed our attention. So in a weird way, she took this criticism of saying, let's practice this a little bit more, and she turned it into a compliment of saying, look how great this is coming. She reminded me to hold the positive and the negative in balance with one another, and I'm telling you, that is a hard truth that we need to be reminded of sometimes. And I'm not just talking about music. It's easy to get wrapped up in our negativity bias that we ignore all the life that is springing up beneath our feet. How often do we hear one critique from a supervisor and it messes up the rest of our week, trying to prove that supervisor wrong? How often do we have an amazing day with our kids, but one mistake and a mess later upsets us for hours because there was one mistake? But the rest of the day was fantastic. How often do we look at our college tests and specifically look for those red slashes through the number, that the things that we got wrong, rather than appreciate all of the elements that we got right that don't have any markings on it? And I wonder if we can actually apply that to our medical tests as well. I know that I'm used to looking at those reports for all of the ways that I'm unhealthy rather than also celebrating the ways that I am healthy. The challenge before us is to retrain our brains from a negativity bias to a balanced perspective. We do this simply by becoming aware of our negative thoughts, and I I can't stress that enough. It's kind of amazing that all it takes is just a simple acknowledgement that that is where our mind 
is going. To be cognizant of our negativity and challenge ourselves to look for positives as well. Ask yourself which patterns of thought will be helpful to you in that moment. When going through grief, for instance, it may be very helpful to sit with the negative and to just feel the rawness of your emotions. Because we're not trying to mask our emotions with this. But if a coworker's critique is going to make you spiral out of control for the rest of the afternoon, maybe it's healthier use of time to reflect on the ways that this project you're working on is going to help the people of the community. And if it's helpful, I invite you to talk through this with a trusted friend who can call you on it when you lean hard into your negativity bias. This is precisely what Jesus did for Peter and reminded all of us by reading the story that negativity can stand in opposition to the life and hope that we find in resurrection. I know I'm going to stun you with this next line, but brace yourself. Life is messy, right? There are no two ways around that. But when we can balance our thoughts, we can find beauty even within the mess. We can see God creating life out of the chaos. We can see resurrection through the tomb. So may God bless us with a balanced perspective as we experience all that resurrection has to offer. Amen. My name is Emily Johnson. I'm a dual licensed therapist. I'm licensed in both mental health and substance abuse. I work for Dodge County Health and Human Services. Just like Pastor Eric explained, our human brain is designed to process a lot of information. Filtering things out is how we really reduce the mental burden and the workload to our brains. Think about that kind of strainer that kind of leaves all the things that we probably don't necessarily need or want. However, it's also straining out the things that we want and should be kind of holding on to. If there are nine, negative, or nine positive things that occur and one negative, our brains are designed to fixate on that really one negative. Our negative mental filter lies below our conscious awareness. That impacts on how we respond to things. It impacts how we kind of have that internal dialogue to ourselves and also how we talk to other people. Filtering out the positive can create this inaccurate and false reality. Continuously negative thinking patterns, you're actually creating default neural pathways in your brain. So think about the fact that continuously negative thinking actually negatively impacts your brain and you're gonna to continuously to default towards those negative thoughts. Tips with regards to when we are kind of becoming aware of our negative thinking and uh, just really kind of have the ability, like Pastor Eric explained, catching yourself, identify what you're saying to both yourself and also to other people. Fact check with trusted people in your life. Um, accept feedback with others and identify your negative thoughts. This actually occurred to me a few weeks ago. I was talking to someone and they're like, wow, you're being really negative. I didn't even know I was doing it. Um, identify what you're grateful for each day. Um, sometimes I have uh, clients who are really focusing on all of the negative. I'll have them come up with three things they're grateful for, new things every day. Really kind of focus on balancing out your positives and your negatives can actually change and your brain can become healthier. Think about the fact that we all have a little bit of an Eeyore in ourselves versus Tigger. So we kind of want to balance out both of those um, personalities and keep our brains healthy.